Welcome to Screens of the Stone Age, the podcast where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. My name is Josh Lindell. I'm a grad student studying Neanderthal teeth, and I'm here with... I'm Dr. Kimberly Plump. I am a bioarchaeologist. I study the human skeleton, health and disease, and evolution. And I'm Dr. Ross Barnett, a paleogeneticist specializing in ancient cats. And today we are reviewing a movie called Evolution from 2001, starring David Duchovny and Orlando Jones and Sean William Scott and a huge cast. Actually, there's so many different people in this one. Julianne Moore. Julianne Moore. Dan Aykroyd. Uh, so who wants to summarize this one for us? Rashid. All right. <laughs> uh, nobody says I can't. I don't work hard for this. All right. So evolution. Um, Are you telling me that this movie about called Evolution about evolution isn't very accurate? Is that what your complaint about this movie is? That's one of my complaints, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, so we open with a kind of CGI shot of an asteroid uh, heading towards Earth. Big scary. And then we cut away to Sean William Scott, who I am going to refer to as Stifler all the way through this, because that's yeah, who he is. Yeah, me too. And I, don't, I didn't commit to memory his name, because I didn't want to use up any of my cells for that. Uh, he He is being weird. He is putting a a kind of Rosassiani, lifelike doll inside an, an old outhouse, pouring petrol on it and setting it on fire for reasons that become clear later on, but aren't clear from the start. <laughs> it starts out so weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and the asteroid becomes a meteorite and uh, crashes to Earth, exploding right on top of the uh, on-fire outhouse and blowing up his car. Uh, so that's that's his introduction. Then we cut to uh, Duchovny, um, Mulder, I think I'll just call him Mulder all the way through, um, <laughs> who is a biology lecturer at a community college. We kind of get uh, updates for him as he's giving his class. He makes seventeen and a half thousand dollars a year. Uh, he's very quick to point out, which <laughs> you know, sounds about right for 2001 community college. It's not an awful lot of money. And he seems like an uh, a teacher that doesn't really give much of a crap. He gives everyone an A, apart from uh, two doofuses who didn't understand the assignment, which was to write about cells. And instead, these two brothers wrote about how their uncle was in a cell and that cells are bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also meet Orlando Jones, who is a geology professor and a friend of Mulder's at the community college. And... Uh, he also works for the Geological Society of America, I think, um, on a part-time basis. Uh, so Orlando Jones's character uh, gets a message saying that there's been a, a kind of meteorite sighting and they, they should go out and check it, see if they can pick it up uh, for the Geological Society. And he takes uh, Mulder with him. They go to the spot and there they find Stifler and the police, and his wrecked car, and he's really annoyed because, it turns out, he has a a, a fireman's exam, um, and that's mm. what he was practicing for by being a, an arsonist, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> makes no sense, uh, but he it was it is the day of his, his test to join the fire service, and his car is knackered, um, and so he's, yeah, upset about that. Um, but Mulder and uh, Orlando Jones go into the, the massive hole that this uh, meteorite has punched into the ground. It's a cavern. They go in and find the meteorite, which the police have already sort of spotted. And it's really weird. Uh, it seems to have stuff growing around it. Uh, it's a rock that bleeds, so it's kind of oozing unknown substances. And this is what really kind of ground my gears is that they then mm. immediately proceed to touch it with bare hands yeah <laughs> i mean the safety protocols on. in this movie are insane yeah <sighs> so they they take some samples of this weird goo that they've just touched and take it back to the community college uh where they where Dukovny uh Mulder looks at it under the microscope and sees that it's uh got cell division going on uh so there's something alive in this 
And I was interested to notice that this is like very much the next scene, and he's there mm-hmm. typing with gloves on. I mean that mm-hmm. that that ship has sailed. That horse has <laughs> bolted. Um, you know, oh, <laughs> he was touching it with his bare hands, and now he's got gloves on to do his typing. I mean, uh, and then a whole bunch of sort of techno babble is spouted. Like he, he immediately finds from looking down the the microscope and doing some stuff that it's got ten base pairs, which is nonsense. And he, he's trying to explain <laughs> this to Orlando Jones, who's the kind of uh, he's just a geologist. I mean, he doesn't know anything. Mm. The, all the geologists I'm, I've been friends with just like to color in and collect rocks. <laughs> it's it's uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. Um, We're gonna get letters. I'm going to get letters. I hope so. You're going to get, a, it's going to be tied around a rock and through your window. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of problems with the, the kind of techno babble. Uh, one is that how on earth would you be able to identify 10 base pairs in a community college lab? I mean, that requires some specialist <laughs> equipment that would be beyond uh, Mulder. And then he says, but uh, all life on earth only has four base pairs. And well, I mean, that's not true, really. It has four bases, but there's only two base yes. pairs, A and T and C and G. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, and so he's trying to convince uh, Orlando Jones how important this is. They found life that's come from an outer space. He says to come and take a look at it. Uh, Orlando Jones is busy thinking about uh, coaching women's volleyball and other stuff. This is oh, a very so weird... creepy. It's a weirdly... Weirdly sexist film uh, for 2001. Oh, it's so mm-hmm. sexist. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so he takes Orlando Jones back to his lab and they look under the microscope and now they're not single cells. They're now multicellular, uh, the stuff that's on his microscope slide. So that's interesting. We cut to Stifler. He's failing his fire test, which is not great. Uh, and there, he's told that he has to go back to working as a pool boy because he's not going to make it to the into the fire service this time. Uh, Orlando Jones and Mulder decide that t- they should take uh, full control of this meteorite before anyone else does, that this is a Nobel Prize winning discovery, which it would be. Um, mm-hmm. And so they they obviously decide that they're going to take their whole class of, I don't know, remedial biology, including the people that mm-hmm. uh, mistake prison cells for biological cells, to the meteor. And so the whole class goes there. Uh, they get past the police they go down and now they see that actually there's kind of mushrooms or mushroom fungi like things all around the meteor and we get a quick shot of one of the many before they were famous people um in this film john cho uh harold from harold and kumar is in this film for like two seconds as one of the students um i didn't even notice that yeah he kind of jumped out at me um and while they're in the cavern and they're sort of being careful and all the students are there they notice that it smells really weird. Uh, and Mulder immediately says, well, that's probably, they're creating their own atmosphere with hydrogen, sulfur, uh, methane, and ammonia. And there's like a kind of blanket of fog on the ground, which they're walking through and they can't see the floor. Uh, with and then, zero safety protocols. The one chick is yeah, in open-toed heels. Open-toed sandals. <laughs> you wouldn't even yeah. be allowed those in a lab. But no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and suddenly the, the, the mist parts and they see that there's tons of flatworms that they're stepping on. Um, but when they expose them to air, when they get out of their uh, hydrogen sulfide, methane and nitrogen atmosphere, they, they die. So they're kind of killed by oxygen. They're trying to terraform the planet, essentially. Uh, and they, they notice that they kind of um, reproduce asexually. So they, they sort of split by, by fission, which they call mitosis, which is not <laughs> also, also not very <laughs> accurate either. Uh, but so, okay, so that's great. So these things are not evolving. They are, uh, adapting there, there, mm-hmm. there's no evolution in this film. It's all kind of, uh, teleogenic Lamarckism essentially. Um, yes. but we'll pass by that for just now. Um, <laughs> Stifler, after having failed his fire test is now back at working at the pool. He has to deal with assholes all day. Um, but he notices that there's weird flatworm things, uh, in his kind of pool filtering area and inside the pool filtering kind of tank, there's a weird kind of fish amphibian, uh, which is not great. Uh, and then the, the college people come back to the site and discover that the military are now there. The military are led by 
Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs, um, which is pretty scary. And also by mm-hmm. Phil from Modern Family uh, yes. in one of his early roles, which is really funny. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and we discover that Mulder knows uh, Buffalo Bill, who is the, the colonel in charge of the operation. Uh, apparently Mulder used to work for the government. He was like a, a very high ranking official and he left that to go and work at community college for reasons. Um, we also meet uh, Julianne Moore, who is a uh, representative of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, who immediately falls over because it's, that's funny. Um, yeah. And is immediately subjected to sort of sexist commentary by Mulder and Orlando Jones because she's wearing clothes. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah, Mulder comes across as a bit of an arsehole, just as much as the, the general. Um, and so somehow... The general doesn't want Mulder and uh, Orlando Jones near the site. He wants it to be a military operation because it's uh, very delicate and sensitive, despite the fact that the police have been there. They've had a busload of of dumb students wandering all over it Mm -hmm. um, who've taken samples. So uh, Mulder and and Jones uh, took samples back to the community college. And once they're banned, they have a a real kind of argy-bargy. And they immediately somehow manage to get to the courthouse. And there's a courtroom scene where... They, All of a sudden, Julianne really Moore's a lawyer. Yeah, Julianne Moore suddenly becomes a lawyer, um, yeah. <laughs> which is weird. Uh, <laughs> but it's really just a, a chance for more exposition. So we discover that Mulder, when he used to work for the army or the gov- government or whatever, he created an anthrax vaccine which he then gave to all of the armed forces and then sent some of them mad. So I mean, he's really, he's a poor excuse for a scientist, essentially. It's like we were uh, supposed no... to feel bad for him, though. And you're like, he should have, he should have not only been fired, he should be in jail. He should be jailed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so that, that's, that's pretty nuts. Mm-hmm. And while this is going on, they, they kind of, I, I can't even remember what the, the outcome of this sort of courtroom session was, but they go back to the community college after being banned from the site and discover that all of their research that they've done in the 24 hours um, since the thing was discovered has been taken, all their samples and whatnot. And so they decide that the most sensible thing would be then to go back to the site, which is now under a heavy military occupation with guards, guns, razor wire, all the rest of it. Uh, Mulder decides to dress up in his old uniform, which is great, I guess. Uh, and they just walk straight in there. Uh, it's not a great advertisement for the US military it has to be no. said um, and they walk straight in there and they managed to get through the uh, security they managed to get themselves some kind of all-in-one protective suits they go straight into the, the cavern where the meteor was uh, and now they find that the aliens are now bugs um, they, there's a bit of kind of back and forth and that apart from the bugs that kind of walk around and are the size of puppies there's some that fly and while they're they're kind of collecting stuff, the military notice that they've broken in and send um, people down to sort of boot them out better late than never. Um, <laughs> but one of the alien flies breaks into uh, Orlando Jones's suit and goes <laughs> right inside him. Um, and this was <laughs> this I remember I, I watched this in probably about two thousand and two on like blockbuster video or something, and I remember this was. Pretty much the only time I laughed in the entire film, even <laughs> back in 2002, was when they kind of rush him to the hospital and the, the, this flies, this alien is under his skin uh, and they're trying to get it out uh, and they, they want to chop off his leg and he's like, no, I don't want that. And then they see that it's moving towards his uh, testicles and so then he said, right, take the leg, take the leg, <laughs> um, which was quite amusing. But then it goes into his uh large intestine it seems and so now they, they think there's a way to get it rectally <laughs> and <laughs> there is like the one funny line, line that is this is where they, they they say to orlando jones we have to go rectally he goes rectally what and then one of the nurses says i'll go and get the lube and then <laughs> the doctor says there's no time for lube <laughs> and, <laughs> and orlando jones says there's always time for lube <laughs> which which did make me laugh even 20 years later so that, that kind of was the high point of the film for me really um so yeah so then it cuts away they, they've kind of managed to get the fly out everyone's fine back to stifler and he is now 
working as a, a kind of barman at a fancy people's golf course, um, I guess attached to the pool. It's filled with the same arseholes as before, but we meet the same guy that was rude to him at the pool earlier, and he has found himself a middle-aged uh, paramour, and they're they're about to have a kind of nighttime picnic at the, I guess the the sand bunker or the one of the golf hazards on the Ooh. golf course, uh, and then a, a kind of um, large uh, alien amphibian comes out of the pool and eats him. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that's okay. But so we're up to like one death. This is the first thing that the aliens have have done that's been a problem to anyone. They've killed a guy who was an asshole anyway. Mm-hmm. So these things are now out of the the cavern. They're away from the meteor. They're at least as far as the the golf course. But Stifler very smartly kind of collects the creature. It it died soon after from from breathing oxygen after killing this guy. But he uh, Stifler corrects it and takes it to the community college to uh, Mulder and Orlando Jones. So we also get a, a sort of small cutscene of how they're in people's houses. Uh, one of them gets mistaken for a dog, which is a joke that uh, Ivan Reitman has done before. I mean, that's a Ghostbusters joke. He's just recycled mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the devil dogs and Ghostbusters. So, yeah, that that's not great. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's so they're, they're, we're we're kind of seeing that they've now escaped and they're out in the general population. Um, but Mulder's like, we got to kill these things while we still can. Bearing in mind that they've only bitten one person, mm-hmm. uh, who you know that's it. That's all they've done. <sighs> But uh, they they go to the house where the the kind of dog sized uh, alien was found, and they see that it's coming from underground. This is a new development. They go outside and see like dozens of of pterosaur shaped alien things with leathery wings about the size of a horse, which no one had noticed before them. Weirdly, um, <laughs> and they're they're all dying uh, from from breathing the oxygen. And while they're watching, one of them suddenly isn't dead but kind of pukes up a baby, which is able to um, cope in the oxygen. So again, not evolution. <laughs> this is straight up Lamarckism that we've got here. <laughs> and that thing flies off. So they decide that they're going to have to uh, go and, and kill it probably, because that's what they want to do. And it's flying off to a mall where it abducts a girl in a changing room uh, and flies off. Um, they, they bring it back through the power of karaoke. I mean, again, We've had this before, haven't we? The the power of karaoke in uh, films with uh, a weird kind of evolutionary prehistory. Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this may be the original. <laughs> so does that make Stifler Jigglypuff? I think it does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what, while they, they lure the, the um, kind of pterosaur alien in, they shoot it with guns, because this is America, guns that they've stolen mm-hmm. from the mall. But things are getting out of hand, I guess. And so the governor turns up at the site of the, the meteorite, and the, and the governor is Dan Aykroyd, uh, an Ivan Reitman uh, staple. And he's probably, I think, the best thing in this. Um, he, he actually takes the, the crap seriously and, and acts uh, his socks off. They do some kind of thing-style uh, extrapolation. So three days till all of Glen Canyon is, is overrun by the aliens, two months for the whole of the USA. Uh, which, you know, I'd like to see the error bars on that um, <laughs> before I rush to, to doing anything serious. But that's not how the military work in this film. Their their plan is just to evacuate Glen Canyon and Napalm, the whole place. Bearing in mind that Napalm is a, a defoliant rather than an, an alien exterminator, but never mind. Um, <laughs> but while this is going on, we're looking through the CCTV cameras, which are trained on the meteor, and we see that they've now evolved into kind of primate-like things. So they're they're kind of they look like snowmen, uh, yetis or sasquatches or something, mm-hmm. and they're smart. So they destroy the CCTV. They they break out of the the cavern. They attack people. They don't kill anyone. They they just kind of act pissed <laughs> off. Um, <laughs> but uh, Julianne Moore leaves with uh, Mulder and Orlando Jones with their files and samples. So she's kind of done with the military. Um, and they go and take their stuff back to the, co- the community college and try and figure out a way to uh, destroy them. This, <laughs> this is where it goes like pretty insane. So uh, Orlando Jones is smoking <laughs> in a lab. Big no. He then flicks his match mm-hmm. 
Which, in a lab. In a lab. Yeah. <laughs> in a lab. Which lands on a on the petri dish full of the alien goo that they've collected. Yeah. Uh, and the, the match somehow causes this goo to just explode in growth and it becomes enormous. So they realize that uh probably nape having them is not going to be a, a wise choice if, <laughs> if they react mm. this well to one match. And then we have some <laughs> real kind of, you know, I guess middle school chemistry going on where they say, <laughs> okay, these guys, their biology is based on, uh, on nitrogen, which comes out of nowhere. At no point have we Yes, discussed- I was going to ask because I, I was like, when did they establish that? Did no, that happen earlier did in not. the movie? No, they, no. <laughs> they said that their atmosphere was nitrogen, but that means jack squat. I mean, our atmosphere is like 75% nitrogen. We're not nitrogen based. Anyway, so, <laughs> and apart from the fact that nitrogen can't form long chain stable molecules, but never mind. Um, and so they, they, they use like the, the, the most insane kind of illogical thing. So, well, arsenic's poisonous to carbon based. Uh, creatures, and that's two down and one along on the periodic table. So what's two down and one along from from nitrogen? Ah, selenium. Okay, these things will be killed by selenium. Right. What has selenium in it? Uh, Head and shoulders, the shampoo. Selenium sulfide. Okay, yep, let's go with that then. We'll kill them with shampoo. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. This this is like, yeah. So they, they, they get Stifler, who manages to steal the fire tr- a fire truck from the fireplace. They fill the fire truck with, with shampoo, head and shoulders, to be precise. <laughs> um, <laughs> they go back to the, the meteorite site, and they see just, uh, they arrive just in time to find the napalm going off, uh, which is great. But then, of course, the thing kind of explodes into this giant kind of globby mass, which is enormous. So it has the opposite effect. It doesn't kill them. It kind of makes them grow bigger. The the kind of expanded alien goo eats some troops. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's like only the second and third deaths. We don't even know if they're dead. And they decide that they have to go and shampoo the anus, is what I've written in my notes. Uh, but give <laughs> so it the head gross. and shoulders enema. <laughs> it's so gross. Which they do. Uh, Orlando Jones gets his revenge for his uh, unlubed uh rectal removal of the alien goo and goes right up the, the animal's uh, the oh, alien's oh, butthole oh, oh. and sprays it with um, head and shoulders and this causes it to explode Thank goodness. Uh, and then we have medals for everyone at the end I mean the governor somehow manages to have medals just in his back pocket for the for kind of random occasions and so uh, Stifler gets promoted to the fire service despite having done nothing <laughs> as far as I could tell uh, Orlando Jones gets promoted to the geological survey uh, or whatever, uh, and uh, Mulder's about to get a medal, but he snuck off with Julianne Moore uh, to have some fun times in the fire truck. Uh, and then the film ends, thankfully. And <laughs> they, there's there's like a, a kind of outtake um, commercial film for Head and Shoulders by these guys in character. That was which cute. is moderately amusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cute. That, that's the best description for it. It was cute. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, this this that film ends, and it was just a massive disappointment. Um, just not funny, not clever, a huge waste of a lot of acting talent. Uh, and I, I really, as someone who loves Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters Two, yeah, disappointing from from Ivan Reitman. I just don't understand why it was so sexist. Like, yeah, it was gross. <laughs> it was gross. But you know what I realized uh, just like a minute ago, because I was going through the whole thing. I was like, this movie doesn't pass the Bechdel test because we have Mm -hmm. like two, maybe three main uh, named female characters. If you count Sarah Silverman, right, Mm -hmm. who's actually has a short piece in this. But uh, none of those none of those women ever talk to each other, Mm -hmm. except that there is a scene where you have these random housewives just having tea and aliens show up at their house. The the. (laughs) dog uh right. yeah uh which is a joke that i just don't really get because nobody would think that's a dog right why it doesn't it sort of is unbelievable to me that they would think what kind of dog do you have uh but they're all talking to each other and they're not talking about a man so i think that despite itself this movie actually passes the bechdel test but like mm. just by accident right like it, yeah, not accidentally yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh but 
I also, so with the ending, I feel like the jump to the shampoo was so strange that I feel like they got Mm -hmm. all the way to this end and they were like, we got to wrap this up quick though. Like, what are we going to do? And they're like, okay, (laughs) let's just do this. Like it was such a. Yeah. Well, uh, I read that like there were lots of rewrites like as they were filming. So I believe that like they'd already been filming the movie and they changed the end. The The original end was supposed to be like a human like that. Those uh, those yetis were supposed to evolve into some sort of human monster and they couldn't work that right. So they mm. switched it to a giant amoeba. And I believe like they were they had already started filming by the time that they they did that rewrite. I feel like there was a lot of cut yeah. scenes too that explain stuff like the nitrogen thing right like the nitrogen yeah Mm. yeah um one of the things that um makes me feel not great about this movie is that it's it's like really sloppily written in some ways Mm. like there's a whole bunch of little things uh let me see in my notes here early on when they're uh first going to see the army guys when they first set up the army base so they're they're driving up and they talk to an army guy and he says, drive straight down to the command tent. They're expecting you. And then they talk to the assistant military guy and he says, gentlemen, just up here, General Woodman's expecting you. And then they meet Dr. Woodman De- or General Woodman. And he says, Ira, what an unexpected surprise. Like they said twice that they were expected. <laughs> but then when they get to him, he's like, what an unexpected surprise. Right. <laughs> uh, and like the whole thing is just kind of like that. It's just like it. it's so fast paced that like it's kind of hoping that you're not, not you don't have time thing. enough to think about all these little these little things uh also at the end they get the the fire truck right uh yeah. stifler is like i know where we can get a fire truck or he's something like that but he very distinctly failed his test yeah. how come he has access to a fire truck right yeah. also the truck is not a, a tanker truck it is a ladder truck uh which i had to i had to I spent way all of my research was on fire trucks for this uh for this uh movie. Uh and I, I had to know, does a does a ladder truck have a tank on it? And like maybe, but a ladder truck is gonna have like the smallest possible tank, like somewhere between two hundred and five hundred gallons, which to be fair, he did say they'd need five hundred gallons. That's a lot so of shampoo. maybe this truck yeah. It's a lot of shampoo, but you know what it's not a lot of is a liquid to exterminate an entire cave system or mm-hmm. a giant amoeba the size of a neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, they need selenium sulfide. And in uh, dandruff shampoo, selenium sulfide makes up about 1% typically of the active. In- it's 1% of the volume. So if they have 500 gallons of selenium sulfide shampoo they've got five gallons i'm not great at math one percent of 500 <laughs> is no, five right. gallons yeah, that is right right <laughs> so a uh, five gallons is uh, about the size of a standard home brewing beer pail like it's a pail that you can carry and they're dumping that on an amoeba the size of an entire neighborhood and that's enough uh, so well, I'm not sure. I might give them some some leeway for this because, like, if they're kind of distinctly comparing uh, the selenium to the alien as arsenic is to us, and so oh. if arsenic has a LD50 of about 15 milligrams per kilogram in uh, in mammals, so that's 15 milligrams per kilogram. So for an average person, that'd be what like 500 milligrams, something like that, would be enough to kill half. Uh, of uh, the people you gave it to um so that's not an awful lot of arsenic for for a person so maybe maybe it would be enough how long would it have taken them to get that much shampoo though like would they were they emptying the little bottles into the thing that's what it looked like they had a big Mm -hmm. pile of empty empty bottles beside the fire truck that would take so long Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here's another detail that i had to do uh too much research into so uh, the ingredient they need is selenium sulfide, uh, and they use Head and Shoulders. But Head and Shoulders, standard Head and Shoulders, doesn't have selenium. It has uh, zinc pyrithione. Mm. And I had to look up: is there uh, Head and Shoulders with selenium instead of zinc? And did it exist at this time? And if you go through the um, the trivia on IMDb, some people are saying. Uh, Head and Shoulders uses zinc. It doesn't use selenium. And others are saying there is a, a, a 
a special kind of head and shoulders that does use selenium, but it wasn't invented until after the movie because the movie made it popular. And Dan and head and shoulders is like, <laughs> the movie made oh, it we popular. can make it with selenium now. Well, uh, or um, shit. But <laughs> uh, th- I mean, there's some great, uh, uh, as far as I know, unpaid. I don't, uh, as far as I read, uh, head and shoulders didn't pay for this product placement this is like a parody of product placement like they thought it would be funny to do such blatant product placement but it's Mm -hmm. it wasn't paid it was just a joke but like you see the bottles really clearly and they're not the standard head and shoulders bottles they're the head and shoulders intensive treatment uh which i think the name has changed but it i looked it up in 2001 those bottles the intensive treatment head and shoulders did use selenium there you go so actually, wow. that is correct, even though it's it's weird to say, oh, Head & Shoulders has selenium when it's like a very niche uh, brand of Head & Shoulders that has selenium. When yeah. you could have gone with <laughs> Selsun Blue, which is a dandruff shampoo that is is selenium, would have made a lot more sense, but whatever. That one was not a, was not a factual error. That one's actually true. Wow. Wow. That is a deep dive on head and shoulders. Yeah, who would have thought that this podcast would take you there, hey, Josh? <laughs> uh, it's one of the things that always bothered me about this movie, because I, I don't think I saw it in 2001. I think I saw it much, many years later, but I was like, head and shoulders doesn't use selenium. <laughs> so I had I had to figure that out for myself. I love that that's what you picked up on. <laughs> so you joined the film, that what? <laughs> head and shoulders doesn't have selenium. This is outrageous. <laughs> Uh, it ruins the whole movie for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Somehow this is the first time I've seen this. Yeah. yeah. And the last? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We should probably talk a bit about you know what Lamarckism is and what versus what evolution is, because I think that's something that this film okay. gets totally wrong. Mm. Uh, many other films and uh, franchises do as well. So, I mean, I'm happy to sort of pontificate on that a little bit <laughs> sure. um so yeah go for it okay so lamarck was a a french um scientist and philosopher in the 18th century i think and he noted that that things change over time things evolved for for want of a better word that the the, the species that are around now were not the same as the ones that were found in the fossil record and the fossil record was something that had just been kind of discovered and was being worked at and he wanted to find a mechanism for for species to change over time, and and what he did was you know it was pretty ingenious, um, very smart, mm. and he thought about well you know we we see some great examples of adaptation. So the classic example is that we see giraffes have long necks to get leaves from the tops of trees, uh, and so he thought well what if giraffes evolved from something like a horse. That, that ate leaves and then it kept stretching its neck to, to get leaves that were higher and higher up and that those uh, ones that were stretching were trying really hard to get the leaves um, passed on that trait to their children so the, their children had slightly longer necks and then because they were stretching their necks to get the leaves at the top of trees or higher up the trees their children had them and so on and so on that this idea that that what uh, what species did during their lifetime was passed on to their their kids was was a great idea at a time before understanding of inheritance and uh, Mendelian genetics and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so Lamarckism is this idea that um, what changes that accrue during the lifetime of an animal can be passed on to its descendants. Um, but it's it's been incredibly debunked over time. It was a great idea, um, but it's just not how things work. And so what's in this film is essentially Lamarckism, that the, the animals are, you know, passing on, as we, show, we see with the kind of pterosaur creature, it, it kind of pukes up its young, and that young is now able to uh, breathe oxygen because that's what the, what the adult was trying to do. Mm-hmm. That's not evolution. Evolution would be if uh, that pterosaur thing puked up a hundred babies mm-hmm. and 99 of them died and one of them lasted slightly longer than the others because it had slightly more tolerance to to the oxygen environment and then was able to grow and pass on um, its traits. Yeah. So the Marxism, there's no kind of uh, sieve of selection that, that there is with evolution by natural selection. Um, it's just a- about acquiring traits and passing them on, which is not how inheritance works and it's not how evolution works. I I think that you could 
if you're being gracious, interpret this movie in terms of maybe not natural selection, but generational change rather than Lamarckism, because, uh, I mean, we don't get very many examples of reproduction, which is kind of key to evolution in both cases, I guess. Mm -hmm. But when, when you have those flying dragons that are all dead inexplicably, uh, that no one has seen them, and then one of them gives birth, and then the new one is tolerant to the atmosphere, uh, we do have a generational change where the parent generation was not adapted and the the offspring generation is adapted. And you could interpret that that's not Lamarckism because the parents were dead, but there was a mutation very luckily in the only one that gave birth <laughs> that just coincidentally made it tolerant to the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, I think I've given them a lot of credit that they maybe yeah. don't deserve. <laughs> Um, but I mean, th there's very few lines to go off of. So I dig into some of them a lot. Like he calls that adaptation. Mm. I don't think there's too many other lines. Like I, I wrote down the mitosis thing too. We could talk about why, well, when the giant amoeba at the end is starting to divide into that could be mitosis, mm -hmm. uh, cause they say it's a single cell, but when the flatworms are dividing into that's not mitosis, that's just asexual cleavage. What would you call yeah. that? Yeah. Fission. Yeah. Perhaps, which is not something that many multicellular things do. Um, you know, that's not how flatworms reproduce. No. <sighs> what are some multicellular that I'm trying to think of back into my biology 12? <laughs> What's a multicellular <laughs> organism that does asexual reproduction? Um, I think, um, well, well, slime molds, I think. Yeah. They can be both single celled and multicellular. multicellular. Um, Tons of plants do. I mean, I'm doing lots of gardening and wild foraging. Like plants are constantly budding off little plants that you can separate out. And so mm. like all tons of the plants in my yard are clones. Like I've, I have strawberries that I'm making them take yeah. over my whole yard and they keep branching out and spider they, plants. they send out a runner and then they mm. spider plants. Yeah, I got yeah. one right in my mm. right there. So yeah, there's tons of plants. Well, they'll they'll send out a shoot and then bud off a new plant and you can cut that that shoot off and then put move the plant around and it'll root itself and then you have clones of the same plant so i think some uh some helminths um so a kind of flatworm if you cut them in two then both halves will grow into different individuals um but, but they don't that's reproduce, not how they that reproduce. Way. that's yeah. just something that happens yeah. if yeah. they get cut in two. something that happens yeah. I think that was the thing about starfish. There's some reason people were trying to exterminate starfish and they were cutting them up and throwing them back in the water and then they each piece grew into a new starfish. I don't know why you want to exterminate starfish, know, but, but the story is in my head for some reason. Starfish eat coral. They're they're pretty bad news if they're uh, if they're not maybe that's under why. control. I mean, asexual reproduction can be really good in terms of um reproducing, obviously, and it's good for fitness in that it's 100% your genes that get passed on to the next generation. But it limits mm -hmm. the amount of variation and sharing of mutations, which can inhibit yeah. quick adaptation as well, right? And that, that's, I think a lot of fungi have both uh, asexual and sexual reproduction for, yeah, I mean, for that, that kind of reason. That would be the best, right? That you could do both. Yeah, best of both worlds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, there's some kinds of fungi that have like many, many sexes. Oh yeah, like like dozens. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thinking back now to undergraduate, uh, yeah, undergraduate courses in um, physiology and stuff. But yeah, fungi are crazy. Uh, it, you know, mycologists respect to them because they're they're not an easy subject to study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, there's a few like big picture problems with this movie that I want us to dig into and make sure we get through them uh, in the time that we have left here. So uh, one of the biggest problems I have with this movie is that these organisms seem to get matter from nothing. They just mm -hmm. grow out of thin air, yes. right? Starting with when he puts the single celled organisms on his microscope slide and he watches them go through mitosis and divide exponentially. And then you watch them on the slide grow and fill out the microscope slide and get so big that they break mm -hmm. it, but there's no food for them, right? Mm -hmm. Like nothing eats, uh, even when they're killing people, almost nothing eats anything, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you have to get matter to eat, to incorporate into your body to grow and things like when they light things on fire, they just get giant, but where does that matter come mm -hmm. from? Right. 
And so that's a pretty big problem with the way things uh, grow and reproduce in this movie. They could be, I guess, photosynthetic, and in which case all they need is light and, and air. But then they're, down, their food they're down in that cavern, though. Right? Yeah. Or they could be, yeah, some kind of chemoautotroph that uses stuff from the air. Mm. But that's, again, I'm pretty sure that they just thought, oh, it doesn't matter. We're not, <laughs> they've not thought deeply about this no. at all. Uh, wh- one of the funny things about this, uh, the way this movie is written about online, is the it's a big movie, uh, which is unusual for us. A lot of the movies we do are pretty obscure. Mm. Uh, so I figured IMDb is going to have tons of great factual errors uh, about this movie, right? And it has none about evolution. The only thing we get is one uh, categorized under incorrectly regarded as goofs. And it says, a bit, fair bit of the quote-unquote science is bogus. The film is a comedy, not a documentary. And so it seems like everybody who's watched this movie has just decided, we don't have to criticize the science on this movie. It, right. it doesn't matter. I mean, you do have to just turn, yeah, turn it off, right? Turn your brain off. Yeah. It's, it's just it's not very funny for a comedy either, which, mm. you yeah. know, it certainly, if, if you're going to do a comedy about scientist then it has to be funny that's why Ghost, ghostbusters work so well yeah is that you don't care about the science because it's really just funny, funny. and hilarious yeah uh, but this this film doesn't have enough humor to to mask the the kind of shoddy uh attitude it takes to science no the two scientists i mean they were creeps they were creepy with their female yeah. student <laughs> they were yeah. sexist to the female scientist they were mm-hmm. like it was just all shitty and then also like you, he gave anthrax or an anthrax vaccine to a hundred, an untested anthrax vaccine to one hundred and fifty thousand people, and then is upset that he got <laughs> fired. Like it's absurd. And then even just the way that they handled, like, so he gets, he goes to this asteroid. There's a liquid coming out, which is already like kind of problematic, right? Instead of shutting the mm-hmm. scene down, he takes it out of the place, like you said, without touching gloves, like glo- no gloves or anything sees that there's mm-hmm. life in it again doesn't do anything right no mask no safety hood no nothing then he, he comes back and sees that that life has has mutated into being multicellular and again like at no point in time have they taken any safety precautions so if it had just been up yeah. to them if the government hadn't stepped in like the big bad government which we're supposed to think in the movie it the world would be taken over by these creatures because these two buffoons yeah, totally. We're just like, <laughs> and at no point in time were they even doing science on it. They never took any notes or photographs or anything, right? So they were like, no. oh, we're going to win the Nobel Prize. But you're like, but with what? Like a story? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't get the Nobel Prize just for finding something accidentally. Yeah. You have to Under- publish <laughs> yeah. it and study it. I don't know. I just at felt- the end when they go to the silver mine, Orlando Jones licks the wall. Yes. Uh, with living stuff on it and he says it tastes acidic yeah i just we're supposed <laughs> although to although be... david Duchovny does say uh stop pretending that that you're doing science or something <laughs> like that when he does that yeah but we're supposed to, to believe rocks. that we're supposed to believe that they're the heroes right and the government is the bad guy and the woman this cdc woman julianne moore that she is on the bad guy's side and then wins, they win her over. And then, so then she goes to the good guy's side, right? Like that's supposed to be this whole arc of the movie. Mm -hmm. And it's completely ridiculous. Like one, as a female scientist having, and especially if I was with the CDC, a scientist that was like expelled for like bad ethical protocol, especially giving people an untested vaccination (laughs) would be the biggest turnoff. There would be no (laughs) coming back from that, right? Like you wouldn't date that guy. There's no no way. And then, but they're not the heroes. They're buffoons. (laughs) Yeah. And that's fine for Orlando Jones because he's a geologist, but um, expect better from (laughs) from a biologist. (laughs) More letters uh, and rocks through windows. Um, But I I thought, I mean, Dukovny... (laughs) Was great in the X Files. He was such such a good uh, actor or character in the X Files, but he's just rubbish in this. He's just like no expressions. He he doesn't do any kind of acting that I can see. Like everything's kind of monotone and unemotional, and it just doesn't work. He's just not likable. Mo- 
but Mulder is is like that. It just it works for his yeah. his um yeah. character. Yeah. Right. It just didn't work for the character here because you're supposed to be he's supposed to be kind of goofy mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Or at least likable, mm-hmm. right? Because Mulder's not even necessarily all that likable no. always. There's always something a bit creepy and off about him, right? Mm-hmm. My favorite part though was when Stifler saw this little gremlin thing in the water, and then it takes off like going into the water supply. He just walks away and closes the door and never tells anybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was great. Uh, okay, here's another big picture problem. So the things can't survive in Earth's atmosphere, and I guess we have to assume it's the oxygen because, like we said, they're nitrogen based, and Earth's atmosphere mm. is like seventy seventy. 9% nitrogen or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then most of the rest is oxygen. So presumably it's the oxygen that they can't handle, which uh, makes sense because oxygen is is really corrosive and most things can't handle it very well. Mm-hmm. But so when they're in the uh, in the cave in the first place, when they first discover the mushrooms and the worms, there's this mist on the ground and they say they're uh, they're modifying their atmosphere. And uh, they say it has, where did I write my notes? Hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and methane, Mm -hmm. uh, which they're just identifying by smell. So maybe that's not Mm -hmm. exactly right. But those are organic molecules that would make sense for some sort of life, possibly. But things don't modify their atmosphere to make it breathable for themselves. Things modify their atmosphere by expelling wastes. And those mm-hmm. wastes are typically toxic to them. So what what are we mm-hmm. supposed to understand is happening here? Are the things, have they evolved into two branches and one of them creates a gas the other one can breathe and the other one uses that gas? And like, have we, have they, is that what we're supposed to believe has happened here? Because it, what the way they describe it, it sounds like, oh, they can't live in oxygen. So they've evolved to create the gas that they need to breathe, which doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense, right? Yeah. The, the way that I interpreted that at first was that I thought it was going to be a life form that kind of sent down like a precursor thing, mm, like, right? Like, like a terraformer. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like it's going to invade this. So it needs to make the atmosphere right, but then it never went there. So then I don't know. I mean, that might have made the movie make a lot more sense, I guess. Yeah. But, I mean, it could be. So again, going back to plants, um, if this is some kind of plant-like photosynthesizer, then they sort of do make their own atmosphere, and then you know, plants photosynthesize to to make um, sugar and oxygen, and then they use the oxygen to break down the sugar. Um, so there is a little bit of a sense that plants kind of make their own atmosphere. But if we go back a step, so yeah, they identify the um, gases as um, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and methane. That's pretty cool because yes, hydrogen sulfide, that's the kind of eggy gas smell. Um, ammonia, that's the kind of fishy, acrid smell. But methane mm. has no smell. Methane is mm. odorless. Um, so how they could mm. smell methane, I don't know. <laughs> They're just that good. They're just that good, yeah. That's why. Uh, Okay. Oh, I was just going to add in some more uh, random factual stuff. So that, like methane, natural gas, um, they actually add the smell to uh, the gas that comes into your home, so that you can smell it if you have Mm -hmm, a leak. mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you know, your house could be filling up with methane, and then you'd you'd uh, (laughs) flick your lighter and and blow everything up. So yeah, there is no smell to methane. Or you'd throw your lit match into a petri dish. (laughs) As you do. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, okay so here's another problem uh the thing crashes to earth and it has presumably one type of single-celled life on it at the beginning and everything else that evolves branches off from that one single-celled amoeba-like thing uh right Mm -hmm. but that thing has been evolving on earth the entire time and earth has an oxygen uh atmosphere so everything that evolved from that amoeba would be evolving in an oxygen atmosphere and therefore nothing should be evolved to not withstand an oxygen atmosphere right from the beginning, right? Because before it creates its own atmosphere, the atmosphere is oxygen, which means it should never have got to a point where you have mushrooms and worms that can only breathe the environment they're creating because they would have evolved in a nitrogen oxygen environment in the first place and they should have immediately been adapted to that environment, right? Yes, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to ask, it goes back to your question, what's making the methane, yeah. uh, hydrogen sulfide ammonia atmosphere? Um, if it's the 
the single celled amoeba, then no problem, I guess. But but the I mean, si- the single cell amoeba might have been in the liquid because he didn't look in the liquid and there was nothing, right? So the first thing he looked in the liquid was the there the amoeba was there. It was never empty, was it? No, the, the, the liquid? liquid stuff has the the cells in it. I think that's what they that's what he looks yeah. at. Yeah, so that's where it started. So if they're and making it, the atmosphere and it has like a, a small local environment that just has that that atmosphere, then that's what they're going to grow up or that's what, going to, what they're going to adapt to. But you're right, the stuff that comes out of the cavern, if it's not going to die straight away, then yeah, I mean we're we're essentially kind of applying our massive intellects to something that. Makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that comes out of the cavern are winged dragons that can't breathe yes. oxygen. So we're to believe these winged, giant winged dragons have evolved inside a cave where there's no room for giant winged dragons to fly around. Why would they have evolved inside a small cave system yeah. to be that big and winged uh, and to only breathe the atmosphere inside that cave? I mean, it. it- there's a fundamental misunderstanding that this whole kind of question of teleology. So the, the idea that um, things evolve through a set pattern, which is exactly the same as has happened on Earth, that you have uh, yeah. you know flatworms, then you have fish, then you have amphibians, then you have dinosaurs, yeah. then you have uh, primates. I mean that's that's just nonsense. That's not how things happen and you know Stephen Jay Gould talks about this a lot in in uh, Wonderful Life his kind of discussion of the the Burgess Shale mm-hmm. and uh, the Cambrian life um, and if, mm-hmm. if you start off with different progenitors so different starting cells different environments then you'll get a completely different result because that's just mm-hmm. the, the random nature of evolution it doesn't happen the same way twice there is no yeah. teleology in biology no if we were to shake it all out and try again we wouldn't be here mm-hmm it's funny because the filmmakers uh, did this very consciously because I think they thought it would make the movie more scientifically plausible. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading uh, some uh, production information uh, on a website here. And uh, actually, Phil Tippett did the uh, Aliens, which is the same guy oh, that right. did Jurassic Park. Yeah. And I think he worked on Star Wars, too. So, I mean, the the animation looks pretty good. Mm-hmm. It does. It does, uh, yeah. Uh, this this page says that though the creature's alien origins gave the filmmakers enormous creative license, applying the basic theory of panspermia, they basically tried to stay along accepted evolutionary paths from single cells to multi cells to flatworms to amphibians and reptiles to birds and mammals. And like, that's the one path that it took on Earth. But like you said, there's no way it would take that path a second time from a different starting point. So yeah. by yeah. trying to make it more plausible, they in <laughs> fact made it as implausible <laughs> as they possibly could have. <laughs> but this is something that we've seen in almost every every movie or TV show that's tried to do something like this. We've seen this, right? So this is yeah. a really big misconception of evolution. Yeah. Uh, okay. One final big Uh, problem here right they do this weird knight's move on the periodic table to find out that the nitrogen-based life forms poison it's one week just like our carbon-based one poison is arsenic it's which is funny because i bet half or more of the elements on the periodic table would kill you if you took enough of them right humans Mm -hmm. famously uh not not uh don't have any problem with uranium or uh petroleum (laughs) or or or, uh (laughs) Yeah. Okay. God. Hydrogen has never killed anybody. No. Nope. No. Nope. Um so they 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 do this weird knight's move on the periodic table to determine their one poison is selenium. But we already know that the atmosphere is poisonous to them, except for yeah. one dragon that evolved to uh, to be in the air, which they killed with a shotgun. So it doesn't seem like anything else has evolved to live in the oxygen environment. Everything else has so far died. All they need to do is pump like air with a big oxygen. fan into the cave and everything yeah. will die, right? Yep. So it's very strange. Yep. And and oxygen is something that actually would be fairly easy to get hold of, unlike head and shoulders. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can talk about uh, alternative biologies. Uh, Ross, you said nitrogen is not a great candidate for an alternate uh, basis for life. Uh, and why is that? And what would, would be a more plausible one? Uh, well, so nitrogen um, has four covalent bonds. No, wait, let me think. Three. 
<laughs> you can cut that out. Um, nitrogen has carbon three has four, right? Yeah, carbon has four. Nitrogen has three. That's uh, why carbon is a good basis for yes, life. Yes, because it can form chains, whereas uh, nitrogen can't because of the, the geometry of um, the, the kind of bonds that it forms. So that's why carbon is so good. It has four uh, bonds that can form with itself and be stable. Uh, and that's why organic chemistry is just the chemistry of carbon, um, because it's everything that's organic has carbon in it somewhere, pretty much. Um, other alternatives, so you'd want something that is able to form multiple um, covalent bonds and also be stable in uh, in links with itself. And so whenever you, you kind of, when people fish around for an alternative biology, they always sort of tend to go for silicon, which is uh, something that w- would be sensible. I mean, silicon doesn't, my understanding is silicon doesn't really form bonds with itself very well, um, but at least it can form long chains in theory. Hmm. And so that's something, I think that's something that the, the X-Files, again, Mulder has done. So there was an, an episode of the X-Files where they found um, this weird kind of fungal organism inside a volcano, uh, which kind of grew alien-like and then burst out of people. And and I remember that they, they said that that was silicon based because there's lots of silicon in, in the ground, I guess. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, carbon, there's no reason why carbon wouldn't be the basis for life on other planets. It works so well on this one. You know, it's just when you, when you say it's non-carbon based, then you're just trying to be different for the sake of being different. And there's mm-hmm. a, almost infinite variety with carbon. So, you know, why, why, why try something else? And uh, carbon is much more abundant in the universe than silicon is. But oddly enough, on Earth, silicon is a thousand times more common than carbon and still carbon-based life evolved on Earth. So if if silicon-based life could evolve, you'd expect it would have evolved on Earth rather than carbon-based life. Absolutely. It's not a question of abundance of raw material, um, which suggests that maybe it's something more fundamental than that. Uh, I was reading something last night uh, about the possibility of nitrogen-based life, and one of the things they said is that nitrogen, uh, when it has when it's forming chains, has a tendency to revert back to nitrogen gas. And so, mm. if you were building a large multicellular organism out of nitrogen, it would be very volatile. And if if you have your solid organism uh, sort of quickly reverting to a gas. The gas, of course, is much less dense, so it would expand. So nitrogen-based life might be very prone to explosions, <laughs> is what this sort of speculative sci-fi uh, page was telling me. <laughs> well, maybe that maybe there's your explanation for why there's they've made their own uh, little nitrogen atmosphere. It's that they they have a tendency to explode, um, and that's... and when you throw a match at them, they, that's what happens. They yeah. just turn into a giant thing. Well, does anybody have anything else in their notes? No. I was just kind of disappointed. I was looking forward to it tonight. I thought it would be funny. Yeah. I guess you, you see David Duchovny's butt uh, when he moons the general uh, <laughs> when he leaves. I mean, maybe that might be of, of interest to to watchers. Yeah. There, I mean, there's just lots of good actors in it that are just wasted, essentially. Like uh, Sarah yeah, Silverman. Yeah, I can't believe... Yeah. I can't believe Julianne Moore was in such a shit movie. Yeah. <laughs> She's much better than this. Yeah, I feel like everybody just kind of signed up because it sounded fun, and then the more like you get one big name, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, if they're in it, mm-hmm. which is a, a shame because uh, you know I like Julianne Moore, I like uh, Sean William Scott, uh, I like mm-hmm. Dan Aykroyd, I like most of the, I, I like mm-hmm. um, Ty Burrell, the Phil from Modern Family. There's mm-hmm. lots of really good actors in this. Yeah, it just wasn't this wasn't written right. No. And then even like the animation and stuff or whatever, that w- was really good too, mm-hmm. right? The The effects were really good. Yeah, especially for 2001, they, they're still yeah, it was, not bad. There was like an ingredient missing though. Mm-hmm. Humor. Humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, apparently it was written as like a serious, scary movie. Uh, oh, right. That mm. wasn't supposed to be a comedy. And then it was rewritten as a comedy. So it's... <laughs> Interesting mm. that there isn't enough comedy in it. Yeah, they just forgot to add any jokes. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, like I said on IMDb, there is no uh, goofs about like the factual inaccuracies of the science or the evolution at all. But uh, there are lots about the military. And uh, here's one of my favorites. Um, There'd be one about guns for sure. Anytime guns appear in a film, <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of... <laughs> 
of uh, rifle fondlers that that point out inaccuracies. <laughs> rifle fondlers. <laughs> Uh, Kate, I'm going to read you here. This is one of my favorite goofs from IMDb ever. It's listed under character error for some reason, but it says after Ira reads the C minus paper, uh, he says the end with a short E vowel. Whenever a vowel comes after the word the, the E vowel should be long, not short. So he should have said the end instead of the end well that's bullshit oh my goodness <laughs> that's wow that's not a thing i don't the end yeah i don't the think end. that's correct either the no end. it doesn't apply to non-americans probably <laughs> i don't think it applies to americans either because no. david duchovny no. said the end and i don't think that's a rule <laughs> no no i've never heard that before <laughs> So apparently, like, anybody can just write these goofs on IMDb. You can write whatever you want. <laughs> can we write one about that goof being a goof? Yeah, mm. let's see. Like I got an meta. account for Screens of the Stone Age. We really should do that. <laughs> I'll put it under incorrectly regarded as goofs. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> If you've been enjoying Screens of the Stone Age, get in touch with us. Follow us on Twitter at SOTSA underscore podcast and on Facebook at SOTSA podcast. Or send us an email to screensofthestoneage at gmail.com. Screens of the Stone Age is supported by the Paleoanthropological Society of Canada. Find out more at pasc-scpa.ca.